that we're talking about wireless transmission. So we've covered wired media. We're going to explain how wireless media works and to understand how we compare wireless media, we need to know something about how wireless transmission works. How do we transmit signals? And we've said already we have a transmitter and an antenna. That antenna takes our input electrical signal and generates electromagnetic waves that propagate through the air. Those waves are received by a receive antenna and converted back to our electrical signal at the receiver. And we've talked uh, briefly about the different types of antennas. We think of a perfect or a, uh, an isotropic antenna as some antenna that propagates energy equally in all directions, in a sphere around. The, if I transmit at some power level, one metre away in this direction, the received power will be the same as one metre away in that direction and in all directions. The received power one metre away from me in any directions, if I'm an isotropic antenna, will be the same. That is, the power that I transmit disperses equally in all directions. In practice, we do not have an isotropic antenna. Our antennas focus the power in particular directions. So the power is stronger in some directions, but weaker in other directions. A special type of antenna is an omnidirectional antenna where the power should be equal in all directions on one plane, all directions around me, but on the other plane, the vertical plane, up and down, it's weaker. So the power five metres away from me in this direction is going to be the same in that direction, but it's going to be weaker five metres up. So that's useful, say, if you want to have an, an omnidirectional antenna to cover an entire floor. You don't care about covering the floor above you or the floor below. You want to propagate your signal only in this area, not up and down. So that's an example of an antenna. And in general, we have a directional antenna where we concentrate the power in a particular direction. In fact, an omnidirectional is a directional antenna. It's concentrating the power in this plane, not up and down. If we compare the power from a directional antenna to an isotropic antenna, we get what's called the antenna gain. So, with an isotropic antenna, if the power one metre away from me was one watt, but with a directional antenna, the power in that direction one metre away from me was five watts, there's a gain of five. That is, my directional antenna is five times stronger than using an isotropic antenna. And that would be the antenna gain of my directional antenna, five. But in fact, we often express the gain in decibels. So it would be not 5, that's the absolute value, it would be we take the logarithm of 5 and multiply by 10 to get, five, or to get the value in decibels and we usually use the I to indicate that it's decibels relative to an isotropic antenna. You may, there's some other ones, but the most common is dBi. means given my antenna, if I have a, an antenna gain of 10 dBi, then it means, compared to the isotropic antenna, my directional antenna has 10 decibels greater power than the isotropic. And we showed some examples of antennas on the website which had different gains. The shape of the antenna determines, the shape and design determines the gain that you can achieve. Basically, the more you concentrate the power, the higher the gain. The more directional it is, if I have an antenna that focuses all the energy in this direction, it will have a higher power than an antenna that, that spreads the energy out. 
So the more focused, the more gain. And we had some examples on that website. The one example of an, a directional antenna is a parabolic dish. You've seen them. You've seen them on TV. You've seen, you can see them on the roof of these buildings pointing to the other campus of the other building pointing to the other campus, we have a dish-shaped antenna. If you've got maybe satellite TV, you may have a dish-shaped antenna, a parabolic antenna. That's a directional antenna that needs to be pointed at the receiver. The transmitter and receiver need to be focused or pointed together. In some cases we can calculate the gain. This is the general way to calculate the gain of any antenna. The gain, the absolute value, not in decibels, the absolute is 4 times pi times the effective area of that antenna divided by the wavelength squared. The effective area depends upon the design. In a parabolic antenna it differs but it may be approximately half of the real area or the physical area if we assume that the parabolic antenna was flat it's a circle. So we could calculate the area of that antenna and the effective area, if it was half of that area, would get the value of AE. And then we could, no if we know the frequency we're using, we can calculate the wavelength and the gain. We'll have an example of that shortly. A calculation. What else do we care about? We have an antenna sends a signal received at the receiving antenna. How does that signal propagate? Depending on the frequency, there are different characteristics as to how a signal propagates. We can generally classify as ground wave propagation, sky wave and line of sight. Ground wave, the frequency of our signal less than 2 megahertz. Sky wave, 2 to 30 line of sight above 30. And the diagrams probably best illustrate that. Sky, uh, ground wave propagation, because of the frequency, it follows the curvature of the Earth. So because of artifacts in the atmosphere and that frequency and, and refraction, it actually bends around the Earth. The Earth is round, so it follows around the curvature of the Earth. That's how we can transmit a long distance. If it was the, this case, line of sight, line of sight, basically the signal propagates in a straight line. For the transmitter and receiver to be able to communicate, they need line of sight. They need to be able to see, see each other in a direct line. So it doesn't bend around the curvature of the Earth. Therefore, in this case, if we want to cover a long distance, we're limited based upon the curvature of the Earth. If they are separated around here, we cannot go through the Earth. In this case, we can go around it. So that's where military and, and shortwave radio applications can be used because you can transmit basically around the Earth using these low frequencies. There are some limitations, on, of course, also on the attenuation. The one in the middle is sky wave propagation where the signal bounces off the ionosphere and the Earth. So again, we can go around the curvature of the Earth by bouncing it off the ionosphere and the ground and it ref reflects until we receive it. So just different characteristics, physical characteristics of the signals at different frequencies, they can reflect off different obstacles. This is the most common one that we're going to talk about. These are used, but they only have special applications. We're very long distance communications. There are other characteristics as well at different frequencies, which we'll see on one of the later slides. Ah, we'll see on this slide. You may not be able to read it here. You should s maybe on your handouts. It's actually listing the frequency, different frequency ranges that we saw, I think, on one of the first slides, which had this diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. 
So the frequency range, some name, it's called the band. The wavelength. Remember the relationship between frequency and wavelength. If we know the frequency, we know the speed of light, C, we can work out the wavelength of that signal. We're not going to go through all of this, but the point is at different frequency ranges, in different bands, we have different propagation characteristics. GW is ground wave, sky wave, line of sight. But even within some of these, there are different characteristics. Some frequencies are obstructed by water and different obstacles. So at some frequencies, when it's raining, the signal will not propagate as well. And we can cover a less shorter distance. Some frequencies go through walls, others don't. Does your infrared remote control work through a wall? You've got a TV at home, you've used one, infrared remote control. Does it work through a wall? If, you were, if your TV was in the other building and you were here trying to change the channels, would it work? What about in this next room? No. The infrared, the infrared remote control is a specific range of frequencies and it is obstructed by different obstacles. That is, the signal will not pass through particular obstacles. Walls are very bad for infrared. Infrared we have down here. So they, don't, they only work over a short range. Wireless LAN. My laptop uses a frequency of around 2.4 gigahertz. That signal passes through walls to some extent. It's obstructed a little bit, but my laptop is communicating with an access point out in the corner, uh, out in the corridors. So it's going through some walls. So different frequencies are obstructed by different obstacles. And that's why we need to choose the right frequency depending on the application, the distance we want to transmit and under what conditions. This lists some of the applications of some of the different frequencies. AM radio, military communications, UHF, VHF, television, infrared, and so on. Satellite communications. So different applications have different frequencies in use. On the website there's a link to a page that describes or lists the allocations of frequencies. This may be hard to see initially but we'll zoom in. Zoom out first and explain. Zoom out less. This is the allocation of frequencies in the US. That is, we have a specific range of frequencies and national and international organisations allocate which frequencies can be used by which applications. Ranging from, we'll zoom in, 3 kilohertz up to here, some, so many gigahertz. We'll see when I can zoom in. And we'll zoom in and we'll see what applications use which or allocated to use which range of frequencies. Let's find a, a part that we can see. still hard to see, but I'll read some out to you if it stops. Here we go. Here are some allocations. So the frequencies are along here. And we have frequencies in what range? Mm. 
this is 72 megahertz, 76 megahertz, 88 megahertz. In the US, the frequencies from 76 megahertz to 88 megahertz are allocated for TV broadcasting and two particular channels. From 88 megahertz up to 108 megahertz, FM radio, and that's similar in Thailand. You tune in to 105 point something, 105 megahertz. So these range of frequencies are allocated for those applications. And to use those frequencies, you need a license. So you need to get a license. In fact, these are divided into separate channels. One portion for one radio channel, the next portion for the second radio channel. And you need a license to transmit the frequency at each channel. And there are many other applications including aeronautical for planes, for the navigation, nautical navigation, for mobile phones, for police radio, for satellite communications, astronomy and many different applications and they all have their frequencies allocated to them. You should check that out and also on the website there's a link to the Thai based allocation the allocation in within Thailand. It's just not as easy to see as that one. So the next thing we can, at different frequencies, our signal propagates in different manners. We also have impairments. When we transmit our signal, our signal attenuates, it gets weaker over distance. So the way in which the signal decreases over distance, we'll see shortly there are some different mathematical models for how they do. One is called the free space loss model. So we'll go into this one in detail. Our signal gets weaker over distance. Different parts of the, or the atmosphere may absorb some parts of our signal depending on the frequency. So water in the atmosphere means as the signal passes through it, the signal gets weaker. The signal may reflect off different obstacles, having multipath effects, and we may have refraction. As an example of multipath, remember our signal has, in fact, multiple frequency components. And they may go in different directions. If we transmit our signal from our m mobile phone tower to our car, in fact, the signal may bounce off different obstacles. So this car receives three different signals at different time and at different frequencies. Our receiver needs to cope with that. So dealing with multiple paths of the signal is a problem in some cases, especially with mobile phones and mobile applications. What we want to focus on is free space loss. That's a significant impairment in wireless transmission. And there's a mathematical model that tells us how much power do we lose over distance and it's given here. It's called the free space path loss model. Why? Because it assumes that we're operating in a perfect environment with no obstacles in free space, in a vacuum for example. So it assumes no obstacles, no loss due to the atmosphere, so it's the best case scenario. The mathematical model is given here it relates the power transmitted, the power received, the distance d, the antenna characteristics where gt represents the gain of the transmit antenna, gr the gain of the receive antenna and the wavelength of the signal we're sending and of course the wavelength is related to the frequency of the signal we're sending. So if we know the power which I transmit using my antenna, I know the gains of both my transmit and receive antenna, I've bought antennas, I know the distance between my transmitter and receiver 
and the wavelength or frequency of the signal I'm sending, I can calculate the received power. And I will know whether my receiver will be able to successfully understand what is received. Okay, you move over here quickly down the front. Quick. We only have 30 minutes left. And you want someone with you? You can. You can join her down the front, please. Come and sit down the front. Yeah. Easy. You can still take your tablet. Go sit down the front. There's a spare seat here. That's okay. It'd be much easier to follow when you're up close. The signal strength that you receive is going to be stronger because we're closer. <laughs> and therefore you can receive more data. So the free space path loss model tells us, gives us a relationship between the amount of power we lose between transmitter and receiver relative to the distance, or depends upon the distance, the frequency and the gains of the antennas. The fact that you moved down the front was to separate you from others and stop talking. <laughs> so don't talk to each other. This is one model. It it's the, deals under perfect conditions. If we're out in space and there are no obstacles, this would give us how far we can transmit given a particular transmit power. But in real life, there are obstacles, there are buildings, there are people, cars. So there are some other models. Some work specifically for inside cities or inside suburban areas. Some for TV broadcasts, some for indoor communications. So there are other mathematical models that tells us the relationship between distance and power transmitted and received. We're just focusing on the free space path loss model. It's a little bit simpler. So let's use that to solve this problem and also use something about our antenna game. We have two, two houses with antennas on top, parabolic antennas, so they're the dish-shaped antennas. Those antennas have a particular size, a diameter of one metre. They transmit a signal of five gigahertz. So we've got a signal with a frequency of 5 gigahertz. And we transmit with some power of 1 watt. So we're transmitting with 1 watt. Our signal is going to propagate, get weaker and weaker and weaker. It's going to be received with some power level. That power level needs to be greater than some threshold in order for the receiver to understand the signal. If when I talk to you, what you receive at your ears is too weak, if the signal is too weak, you will not understand what was sent. That is, the received power level must be greater than some threshold. In this case, if we have a distance of one kilometre, we want to know what is the required received power threshold of the receiver. So we need to use our free space propagation model as well as some knowledge about the antennas to discover this. So let's write down what we know. situation we have two antennas, one transmitting to the other over a distance of one kilometre. So the distance one kilometre or one thousand metres. This antenna is transmitting with a transmit power of one watt. So PT, the power in which we transmit, is one watt. That's a W there. 
and that's our transmit power. We're sending a signal. The frequency of that signal is 5 gigahertz. We transmit, the power we transmit with gets weaker over distance. The amount that it decreases over distance is given by the previous slide, the equation that we had. And then we receive with some power, let's say PR. This received power needs to be greater than some threshold for the receiver to understand that signal. What is the value of this threshold that we can accept? Basically, we need to calculate PR. What else do we know? If we go back, we also know that our two parabolic antennas have a diameter of one meter. In our equation, it, we have PT, we have the distance, 1,000 meters. We want to find PR, lambda, is the wavelength, the speed of light divided by the frequency. We know lambda because if the frequency is 5 gigahertz, lambda is the speed of light 3 by 10 to the power of 8 divided by 5 gigahertz, which is three by 5 by 10 to the power of 9. Since we know the frequency, we know the wavelength. It's 3 over 5, or 0.6 times 10 to the power of minus 1. So we know the wavelength, it's actually in metres. We know lambda, d, pt, we want to find pr. What about gt and gr? These are the gains of our two antennas. We need to consider them because what happens, we transmit with some power level, the way to think of the gain is that that amplifies the signal. It's a gain. So how much gain do we have? How much amplification? We need to find that. So this antenna has a gain GT, the gain of the transmit antenna. This antenna has a gain GR, the gain of the receive antenna. Both antennas have a gain. How do we find them? we need to know something about the characteristic or as assume something about the characteristics of the antenna. And if we go back, so we've got a parabolic antenna. If we look at that front on, it's a circle. We said it has a diameter of one meter. That's looking at the antenna, the dish-shaped antenna front on, a diameter of one meter. Go back to our model about antenna gain. This relates the size of the antenna, or the effective area, the wavelength with the gain. So the effective area, let's make an assumption that in our case the effective area, AE, is one half of the real area. Now that's an assumption we've made with different antennas this 0.5 may be different, but in this case, let's say it's one half, and that's reasonable to assume. What's the real area? Well, it's a circle with diameter of, point of one meter. Calculate the real area simply pi r squared. Pi times the radius, 0 0.5 meters squared. So the real area of this circle is pi times 0.5 squared. 0.5 because the diameter was one meter, the radius is half a meter. The effective area of the antenna we're saying is one half of the real area. One half, one over two times pi times one half squared.
which is pi over 8. 1 over 2 times pi times 1 over 2 times 1 over 2 is pi times 1 over 8. So the effective area of our dish is pi over 8. So now we know the effective area. We already know the wavelength of the signal we're sending. It's here. We can find the gain of our antenna. The gain of our transmit antenna is 4 times pi times by the effective area four times pi times pi over eight divided by lambda squared. Lambda squared was our speed of light divided by our frequency. Three fifths times ten to the minus one. Squared. We can solve, calculate that value. Can I make it easier? That may be useful later. Let's get the absolute value. We need a calculator. Four hundred and thirty six, about point something. So it's approximately a gain of four hundred and thirty six. You can check that. It's just four times pi squared over eight divided by our lambda squared. You don't have to manually calculate that in a, a quiz or an exam, you can simply use your calculator. So the gain of our transmit antenna is 436. This is the absolute gain, not in decibels. It's a ratio between the power of our transmit antenna compared to an isotropic antenna. The receive antenna is have, going to have the same gain. If we use the same equation, our receive antenna is the same size as our transmit antenna, same diameter. Keep things simple. If it's the same size, we'd use the same values and we'd get the exact same value. So we can say GT, the gain of the transmit antenna, is 436. And since the receive antenna is the same size, we'd calculate to be the exact same value. If it was a different size, we'd have to calculate again. Any questions so far? <coughs> All we've done is used our equation for the antenna gain to calculate what the value of that gain is. This is under the assumption we have a parabolic antenna, which the question stated we did, and that the effective area, AE, is half of the physical area or half of the circle, the area of that circle.
where this was the diameter of the antenna. Let's go back to our free space path loss equation. So this is the equation we have. We know the gain of our antennas. We know the frequency and the wavelength of our signal. We know the distance between the transmitter and receiver. It's given in the question on the next slide. We're going to use this equation to find PR. Let's write this equation but rearrange it. rearrangement of this equation gives us this. PR, the received power, is equal to the transmit power times by the gain of the transmit antenna times by the gain of the receive antenna times the wavelength of our signal squared divided by 4 pi times the distance, all squared. All I did was rearrange this equation. PR up here, this down and this goes up. So our question was, what is the required received power threshold of the receiver? What is the minimum received power that we can tolerate? So we're trying to find PR. And in fact we can easily solve it now because we have PT is 1 watt, PT is 1, GT is 436, GR 436, lambda squared, lambda 3 fifths times 10 to the minus 1 is 0 0.06 meters. So lambda squared would be multiply point 0 0.06 squared, all divided by 4 times pi times by the distance in metres, 1,000 metres, all squared. Gives us an answer. It's approximately 4.3 microwatts. Micro, remember, 10 to the minus 6. 4.3 by 10 to the minus 6 watts. You can check that in your own time. I hope it's correct. Just did it then. Just using the calculator, solve this, and similar over there, using the calculator, solve for the gain. What does it say? So, final answer. 4.3 microwatts. What it tells us is that in this, in this condition we have a scenario with two antennas separated by one kilometre. Antennas of this size and a power transmitted at one watt. We transmit at one watt. That's our signal strength. 
the antenna increases, effectively increases that signal. We have a gain. Why does it increase the signal? Compared to an isotropic antenna, an isotropic antenna disperses the signal all around. Our parabolic antenna concentrates that signal in one direction. So in that one direction, our signal is very strong, much stronger than if we dispersed it everywhere. So we start with our transmit power, we have some gain. Over distance, our signal gets weaker. It gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And then it's received by the receive antenna, which also has some gain. And the result is the receive power strength, PR, which is 4.3 microwatts in this case. We transmit it at 1 watt, we receive at 4.3 microwatts. About 1,000 times or 250,000 250, times less than the transmit power. 1 watt, 4 microwatts almost a million times less than the transmit power. So this is showing how much the signal reduces over distance. And that's what our free space path loss model allows us to do. Alternatively, if we knew the transmit power and if we knew the receive power as well as the gains and the lambda, we could find what's the maximum distance we could transmit. That's useful. You want to, so you can use this information, you want to create a wireless link between your home and your friend's home. You know the characteristics of the transmitter and receiver, you go and buy an antenna and a transmit system and you buy a receive antenna, so you know the gain of your antenna and the transmit antenna. You, if you know how much power you can transmit with, the power to receive is usually a characteristic of the receiver. So you can calculate the distance you can transmit using those two antennas. How far you can transmit, whether you can transmit to your friend's home or not. One last quick calculation. What's the loss in this example? We transmitted with a power of 1 watt. We received with a power of 4.3 microwatts. So we know how much power is lost between the transmitter and receiver. The loss of our communication system in decibels is 10 log base 10 of our transmit power divided by our receive power. One watt divided by 4.3 microwatts, take the logarithm, multiply by 10, and we get our loss value, whatever it is. 10 log base 10, this is approximately 250,000. You need your calculator to solve that. It's around 55 decibels. So, we transmit this power, we lose 55 dB. Why do we lose power? Because our signal gets weaker over distance. By how much? This tells us by how much. And this equation tells us by how much. And that's what's important. So here we know the loss or the gain is minus 55 dB. 
the gain is the opposite of the loss. I don't know if it's exactly 55. You can take the logarithm of this and see what you get. So when we design communication systems, we care about how much power do we lose, the loss across a particular link, especially with wireless communication systems because a major factor is the loss of the signal strength over distance. So I think that finishes for, for today. The key points, try some examples and there'll be some examples from last year's quizzes and I'll put one on the homework this week. Some examples that involve using this equation and even the gain equation to calculate particular values like the distance needed, uh, the distance covered, the power needed. And then next, next week we'll finish on the wireless transmission, look at some examples of wireless media and move on to the next topic. That's enough for today. <laughs>